Okay, it's Brian, and we're taking a look at a review and practice problems for day three, and this covered chapters nine through 12. And remember, those were the topics that had to deal with conservation, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and then we did some stuff with thermal energy. So our first scenario is squid locomotion. And remember how squid work, okay? So we have a squid, we have the squid takes in water, and I've drawn a very, very uh, idealized version of this. And the squid plus the water initially is at rest, and then later the squid ejects water, and so the water moves to the right at a speed v sub w, and the squid recoils at a speed v sub s. That's the speed of the squid. But the momentum of the squid plus the water is still zero because initially it was zero, and so after the ejection of the water it's still zero. And so I can say the mass of the squid times the speed of the squid is equal to the mass of the water times the speed of the water. The momentum of the squid to the left is equal to the momentum of the water to the right. That's what must be true by conservation of momentum. And if we go ahead and plug in numbers and see what we get, we get that the squid is recoiling at a speed of 0 0.75 meters per second. Now the next part asked about the thrust force, and what I saw people doing is you're looking for an equation for thrust force, and don't do that. That just kind of like takes you down some weird rabbit holes. So, so, so what you want to do is just to say this, look, the momentum of the squid changes. And we can treat this problem right here by saying as the squid is ejecting water, it's producing a force on the squid. And when we had these kind of impulsive problems, we said that the average force that was acting was just equal to the change in momentum divided by the time interval. Now since the change in momentum of the water is the same as the change in the momentum of the squid, I can do either one. But let's go ahead and do the squid. And so the squid changes from a momentum of zero to a momentum of 4.0 kilograms times 0 0.75 meters per second. And it does that over a time of 0 0.1 seconds. And so I end up with a force of 30 newtons. And those are the two basic relationships that we saw when we were solving problems having to do with momentum and conservation of momentum. Next piece of the puzzle, we're thinking about energy. And we're asked to think about the efficiency of this locomotion. And let's think about this. Efficiency is generally what you get divided by what you had to pay. But we mean that in energetic terms. So think about this. What does the squid get? What the squid gets is motion. Okay, it's moving at a certain speed, it's getting a certain kinetic energy. So what the squid gets is the kinetic energy of the squid. What it has to pay is all the energy that it put into this, the system, which is the kinetic energy of the squid plus the kinetic energy of the water. If you look at this system from the initial position, no kinetic energy, to the final position, when you have the squid and the water have a kinetic energy, there's a change in the kinetic energy of the squid and the water. All that energy has to come from the squid. That's what the squid has to pay. What it gets is the kinetic energy of the squid. And if I put in the numbers that I have right here, I end up with an efficiency of about 0 0.070. That's all about 7% efficient. Well, 7% efficient is terrible. And if I put in the 25% metabolic efficiency, I end up with an overall efficiency of about 1.7%. And so this is very, very inefficient. So, so squid don't use that to get around as a rule. What they use it for is to um, escape. So if you're about to be eaten, well, that would be worth to do something costly. Or if you're going to catch prey, and it's a very tasty prey with lots of calories, maybe it makes sense to spend that. But under normal circumstances, they don't. And typically what they would do is they would move a larger mass at a slower speed, so they would put less kinetic energy in the water. And in fact, that's what fish do when they use their fins. Now, the next problem has to do with horsepower, okay? And a horsepower is about 750 watts. And that actually came from a time when people used horses to do work. And in fact, what they they measured this for was lifting water out of mines. Um, this was in England that this was done, and, and horses were used to basically run pumps that pumped water out of mines. And so we're looking at that situation. Horses pumping water out of a mine, and it's lifting it from a depth of 20 meters to the surface. Okay? Now, 
Let's solve a couple of problems before we get into our basic calculation. The horse is working steadily. And the question is, what is the metabolic power? Well, the horse's power output is 750 watts. And so the amount of energy the horse has to use, what it has to pay basically, is four times 750 watts or 3000 watts. That's the amount of metabolic power the horse is using. And then think about that. Okay, so the horse is using energy. It's basically burning chemical energy at 3,000 joules per second. It's using 3,000 joules per second of metabolic energy. 750 joules per second, 750 watts goes to useful work. What happens to the rest of it, the 2,250 watts, that goes to thermal energy. And we're going to use that number down below. Okay, so 2,250 joules per second goes to thermal energy. And the next question asks us two parts. First off, if the horse works a full eight-hour day, how much water can it lift to the surface? And then second, if it keeps cool by sweating, how much water must be evaporated from its skin over the course of the day? Those are the two pieces that are asked. Now first, let's take a look. Let, let's do a, a bit of a, a preparation step. Okay, so in my preparation step, what I want to do is I want to work out how many seconds are in eight hours. Okay, so eight hours is equal to 2.88 times 10 to the fourth seconds. That's going to be useful because we're told basically how much work the horse is doing. It's doing a work of 750 watts or 750 joules per second. And if we take that and we multiply it by the number of seconds, you can figure out how much work the horse does. Now the horse is racing, raising water from a mine to the surface. So I have a certain amount of water, mass M, and the horse raises it by a distance of 20 meters. Now, if I use my basic equation for conservation of energy, it looks like this. The kinetic energy plus the potential energy plus the work is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy plus the change in thermal energy. We're going to treat the system as the water. So the system is the water. The water starts out at rest. It finishes at rest. The horse doesn't have to like hurl it at great speed once it gets to the surface. It just has to be get it there. The initial potential energy is zero. The final potential energy is just equal to m times g times y, where y is going to be equal to 20 meters. Okay, we know that that's true. Change in thermal energy would be if there was energy loss due to friction, say in bearings and stuff in the pump. Let's assume it's a very efficient system, so we don't have that. And then it basically says this. The work put in by the horse is equal to the final potential energy of the water. Well, the work done by the horse is equal to the power the horse is putting out times the time interval, or 750 joules per second. That's the power of the horse times 2.88 times 10 to the fourth seconds. That's the amount of work the horse does. That's equal to m times g times y. Now, we said y was 20 meters. That's how much the horse has to raise the water. g is 9.8 meters per second squared, as always. The only thing we don't know in this expression is m, and that just tells us how much water is the horse able to lift during that amount of time. And if we do that, we come up with a mass of water of 1.1 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. So that's about 110 tons of water. That is a lot of water, but the horse is working pretty hard. That's 750 watts, and it's doing that for an eight-hour day. Um, so that seems reasonable to me. Now, the next question asks about how much the horse has to sweat, basically, to keep itself cool. Okay. Now, the horse will need to exhaust into the environment every second an amount of energy of 2,250 <coughs> joules. Okay, so 2,250 joules per second. That's the amount of energy that's going to thermal energy. So every second it's got to deposit that much energy into the environment, and it has to do that over a period of time of 2.88 times 10 to the fourth seconds. And it does that by evaporating water. Um, anyway, the change in thermal energy, the amount of energy the horse has to exhaust into the environment is 6.48 times 10 to the seventh joules, and it does that by evaporating water. And remember, we said the amount of energy 
required to evaporate water, which is equal to m times Lv. That's the heat of vaporization. And if you're looking at skin temperature, this is 24 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. I know how much energy is exhausted. I know the heat of vaporization. I can solve for what the mass is. And if I do that, I come up with a mass that the horse has to sweat of 27 kilograms. And one kilogram is about equal to one, is equal to one liter, so that's 27 liters. In other words, that's getting on towards eight gallons of water. And, and that makes sense. I mean, horses are gonna have to drink at least a gallon of an hour and per hour to be able to do this. So that, that seems quite reasonable to me. Now the next problem has to do with fleas. And when fleas jump, the amount of energy that they're putting out in a very short period of time is so great, the power is so great, it can't be done with muscles, okay? They use spring-like structures in their legs, and we're given data for the flea. It, if there were no drag force, it could jump to a one meter jump height. Flea has a mass of 0.75 grams, and it does this over a distance of three millimeters and a time of 0.7 milliseconds. Now, if we ignore the drag force, what's happening is this. From a stationary flea on the ground, with its legs basically ready to go, energy is stored in the form of elastic potential energy to its highest point when it's not moving. The energy goes from elastic potential energy, U sub S, to gravitational potential energy, U sub G. There's no kinetic energy. That's an intermediate step. But from the point where it's stationary on the ground until it reaches its highest point and it's stationary there as well, we have elastic potential energy being converted to gravitational potential energy. Now, and we said if there was no drag, the flea could go from a height of zero to a height of one meter, okay? But in fact, the flea can only go to a height of about 0.4 meters or 40 centimeters, okay? Basically, and, and we want to know how much energy is lost to thermal energy. Well, the final potential energy is just m times g times y, okay? So if the horse, or if the, sorry, if the flea only makes it 4.4 meters, it's only making it 40% as high. It only has 40% of the final potential energy. As a consequence, it lost 60% of its energy to the drag force. Now for the problem, we're asked to find the specific power during the flea's leap. And just for ease of calculation, we're going to treat the case where there's no drag force. Okay? And there's two phases to the motion. And the first phase of the motion is the push-off. So the flea starts with his legs contracted. Energy is stored in the springs of the legs. Next, it pushes off, and so it achieves a certain vertical speed, and then ultimately, it achieves some height, okay, above the surface. It achieves a height of 1.0 meters. So think about the changes in energy. Here, I've got elastic potential energy that gets converted to kinetic energy, which gets converted to gravitational potential energy. And I'm interested in the specific power during the flea's leap. Well, the flea is only doing, basically putting out energy during this phase, when it goes from spring potential energy to kinetic energy. So we're interested in that phase of the motion. But to be able to get a number for how much kinetic energy it has, we're going to say that kinetic energy is equal to the final gravitational potential energy. And we can work that out. That's just m times g times y. Okay, whatever number in joules I get for the flea at its highest point, that is going to be equal to the kinetic energy that it had on liftoff. And if we work that out, that's 7.35 times 10 to the minus third joules. And the flea achieves that liftoff in a time of 0 0.70 milliseconds. So the power of the leap is just equal to the change in energy divided by the time interval. Well, the change in energy is 7.35 times 10 to the minus third joules. The time over which that happens is 0 0.70 times 10 to the minus third seconds. And so I end up with a power, kind of an astonishing power, for something that size of 10.5 watts. And we can see how astonishing it is by computing the specific power. And the power 
Specific power is that 10.5 watts divided by the mass of the flea, which is 0 0.75 times 10 to minus third kilograms. Okay, we end up with a power of 14,000 watts per kilogram. So the specific power is off the charts. And think back to when we talked about muscles. The bush baby was the highest case that we saw. And for a bush baby, I think it was about 180 watts per kilogram. And that was at the extreme outer edge of what you can do with muscle power. This is clearly more than that. And the only way you can do that is to have energy stored in springs. So the spring uses its muscles. I'm oh, sorry, the flea uses, it, uh, uses its muscles to load up a spring and then it releases the spring and the flea takes off. And during that takeoff, there's an intense watts per kilogram. Next problem has to do with a, a pogo stick that I have. And this is kind of a really an intense pogo stick. Um, and, and, and if you're braver than me, you can get bouncing. You can achieve a height of two meters off the ground. Now to do that, you have to like stretch the elastic bands inside the pogo stick to a distance of 0.4 meters. That will launch you two meters above the ground. Okay. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the inverse of that for the first question. The first question says, if a pogo and rider is at the high point of a two meter jump, will drop 1.6 meters and then the plunger starts to touch the ground and it slows down over an additional 0.4 meters as the elastic bands stretch. Question is what approximate average force does the pogo stick exert on the ground during the landing? This is basically a force in motion problem. So the pogo plus rider drops from a distance of 2 meters, and it drops 1.6 meters before the pogo plunger touches the ground, and it slows to a drop over an additional 0.4 meters, so it looks like this. Starting at 2.0 meters above the ground, free fall until a distance of 0 0.4 meters, and then come to rest at a distance of 0 meters. So I have two phases of the motion. The first one is free fall, and so the speed is going to increase as the pogo goes down there. And then I have a region of coming to rest where the speed is going to decrease, like so. So I clearly have three important points of the motion. I have the start, point one, and then the midpoint, point two, and then the final point, point three. Now, if I know that the pogo plus, the pogo plus rider has dropped over a distance of 1.6 meters, I can work out how fast it's moving when it gets to that point. And if I do that, I come up with, the at point 2, the speed is 5.6 meters per second because it's basically free fall. And then we're going to say the pogo plus rider is coming to rest in a distance of 0.4 meters from a speed of 5.6 meters per second. And a free body diagram for the situation looks like this. There's an upward normal force from the ground. Okay, and that's also equal to the force that the pogo stick exerts on the ground because those two forces have to be equal and opposite. There's a downward weight force. F net is equal to M minus W. F net is also equal to M times A. So M times A is equal to N minus W, which is M minus M times G. We're looking for n, and I can solve for the acceleration because I'm told that the pogo comes to rest from a speed of 5.6 meters per second over a distance of 0.4 meters. So I can work out the acceleration. Having worked out the acceleration, I can solve for the normal force. I will leave the steps to you, but if you do that, you come up with a force of 4,000 newtons. So that's a force in motion problem. Next up, okay, we asked, we're asked the conceptual question. If you jump from a height of two meters, you'd break yourself. Um, but the pogo rider can do this repeatedly, bounce after bounce. How does the pogo stick make this possible? And this comes back to the conservation of momentum stuff that we talked about. We said that the force in some sort of a collision is equal to delta P over delta T. Now, when you hit the ground, your momentum goes to zero. Your momentum changes. There's nothing you can do about that. But I can make the force smaller if I make the time interval bigger. So ultimately, that's what the elastic bands are doing for you. They let the rider come to rest over a longer time, thus reducing the force. Next piece, we are asked this. Assuming the elastic bands work like a spring, what is the spring constant? And then when I bounce on the pogo, I don't compress the plunger all the way. About 0.2 meters is my max. That is actually about true. For this compression, how high would a rider go? 
So to solve this, what we're going to do is this. We're going to do a conservation of energy problem, and we're going to start with the pogo plus rider with the plunger completely compressed, and the rider is riding the pogo stick like so, and the plunger is completely depressed, and then we'll end up with our final state is the pogo plus rider is up in the air, the plunger is extended, the person is riding it, and it's at its highest point. And so it's going from a situation where I have spring potential energy stored in the pogo to where I have gravitational potential energy of the height. And the distance vertical between these two points is 2.0 meters. Okay? Now, let's think about our basic equation for conservation of energy. It's the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy plus the work is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy plus the change in thermal energy. Well, let's assume that it's an efficient pogo stick. We're not losing energy to friction, so there's none of that. Nobody's pushing, so there's no work. In this system as described, the pogo starts at rest, and it finishes at rest. I just have elastic potential energy being converted to gravitational potential energy. Well, elastic potential energy is 1 half times k times x squared, where x is the compression of the spring. Gravitational potential energy is m times g times h, where h is the height. The height is 2.0 meters. The compression of the spring is 0 0.40 meters. And with uh, the mass of the pogo plus the rider is 80 kilograms, I have everything in hand to be able to solve for the spring constant. And if I do, I get a spring constant of 19,600 newtons per meter. Now the next question asks the same thing, except it says, how high would you go if you only compress the plunger by 0.2 meters instead of compressing it by 0.4 meters. Well, it turns out the initial and the final states are exactly the same. The plunger is compressed a certain amount. The rider is on the pogo. And then the rider finishes at a lower height with the plunger extended. And the rider is up here. Okay. Rider ends up up in the air by an amount. Let's just call it Y. And, and the analysis is exactly the same. It's, I can just say that 1 half times k times x squared is equal to m times g times y. y is what I'm solving for. I know what mass is. That's 80 kilograms. I know what k is. That's 19,600. And I know what x is. That's equal to 0 0.20 meters. So if I solve for what y is, I get y is equal to 0 0.50 meters. Quick assessment, okay? The kinetic energy stored in the spring, I'm sorry, the potential energy stored in the spring is 1 half k times x squared. So if I take x and I divide it by 2, I take the energy stored and I divide it by 4. So I should, would expect to go to 1 quarter of the height. In fact, that's what we find. And so our assessment is that our final answer makes sense in terms of what we know about energies. And that's number four. We will be back on Monday with another set of problems for you folks to think about.